This episode was made possible by our generous patrons. Welcome to episode 154 of the Inked Film Podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss the first half of Matt Ruff's 2016 novel, Lovecraft Country. So welcome to October, James. I know uh, we're actually recording this on the final day of September, but when this comes out, it will be October. Uh, my favorite time of year. It feels like we're just starting to get into fall is in the air and it's the spooky yeah. season. It's already getting cold here, so I'm I'm all about that. Summer summer's <laughs> finally over, um, and we had our first presidential debate last night, which we oh, yeah. can't not talk about. <laughs> Speaking of uh, horror, right, like uh, yeah. the national horror that we are witness to at this moment, for sure. Uh, yeah, it was a shit show. I actually watched the whole thing, and um, yeah, me too. It was brutal, man. I, I like I, at the end of it, I felt like I had been in a fight, like a physical totally. fight. Yeah, totally. No, I was like shaking crazy. a little bit and I was just yeah. stressed out the entire like adrenaline time. Adrenaline was going like it was like I had been being shouted at, you know, like oh, it was there, so oh, bad they were and... shouting. They were shouting. The moderator was like, just shut the fuck up, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, I mean, God. not condemning white supremacists, like just like full on just I mean, like talking about Antifa and all this stuff. And it's like yeah. Antifa for people I'm sure that listen to this podcast is anti-fascism. It's like opposing fascism, and if you if you don't oppose fascism, then I don't know that I like agree with you on a moral standpoint. Yeah, I just like watching all of this has just made me, you know, it's it's obviously we've been descending into this like craziness for years now. But um, yeah. just please vote, everyone. That's like that's what yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah, and that, that's the thing that came across for me too with his sort of uh, paranoia about the voting, and you know the terrifying calls to have his supporters like go and watch and all this shit, which is illegal. Um, all of that t- to me tells me that he is terrified of people voting against him. Like, and he, you know what I mean? Like he wouldn't be this desperate if he wasn't afraid of it. So like do it like that. It will beat him. That's the way to beat him. Uh, let's, let's get together and do this. Um, vote early. If you can make a plan, trust in the system, you know, like fortunately for us, he doesn't run fucking everything yet. So uh, yep. let's 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 uh use democracy while it still exists in this country and and beat them um speaking of all of this crazy shit and white supremacy and all of that like that perfectly ties into what we're talking about this week with lovecraft country um we are focusing on the first half of the book today by matt ruff um we haven't seen the show at all uh, i think both of us have stayed completely completely clear of it we're going to be starting it for next week's episode um, where we're going to watch the first five episodes that are out right now um, mm-hmm. Then we'll be back the following week to finish up the book, reading the rest of it, and then we'll be back the following week after that to finish up the show and and put a bow on the entire coverage. So we're going to be doing a whole month of Lovecraft Country, which at the same time feels like a ton and not nearly enough <laughs> to me, <laughs> you know, because yeah. like, there's so much content to to really get into. Um, But we found that this tends to be the way that we can cover a TV show where we don't have to devote like half a year to it, which otherwise we would end up doing. Yeah, Uh, it's been really hard to stay away from the show, honestly. Like I've just been Mm. hearing good things. I haven't heard any spoilers or anything yet, but uh, I've been so excited. It's on HBO and and I've been really happy with a lot of stuff they've put out. And we've, you know, Sharp Objects, Watchmen, things that we've talked about on this podcast. It's been there's been a lot of great stuff. Um, Yeah. And just like this, this right now is, you know, it's hitting, it's hitting really nicely for everything going on. And I can't wait to get into this, this story. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, HBO is like what, it's still the gold standard of, of dramatic television, I think out there. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff being made across a lot of different areas, but I mean, Chernobyl, like, I mean, it's it's the gold standard. It's it's so good. So uh, yeah, I I can't wait to, to watch this show. Yeah, and I remember everybody was all worried as as Game of Thrones was ending, and it honestly it was like they didn't even skip a beat. Like Game of Thrones didn't end how people wanted it to, or however anybody thought it would, and yeah, and uh, went right into like other fantastic shows and everything that they've been putting out has been really great this year. 
Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you before we got into this, uh, our, our, our real discussion, um, and I'm sure we'll circle back on this, but what is your experience with H.P. Lovecraft, the original author who this the title of this book is referencing and is referenced throughout the book? I am f- familiar with like H.P. Lovecraft's influence, I think. I don't know mm-hmm. that I've ever really read H.P. Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I have, it was like, I don't know if he wrote short stories or anything like that. It was something short. I never, re- I've never yeah, he delved into anything that was like specifically like, you know, I'm familiar with Cthulhu and so many things have like, you know, have like extrapolated on what HP Lovecraft sort of started and set up, or I assume started and set up in, in some mm-hmm. ways, the sort of like overbearing, like unknowing, unknowable, like, uh, existences that we can't even comprehend and all that kind of stuff is really fascinating mm-hmm. to me. So I, I'm enjoying the stuff that's in this so far. Yeah, so H.P. Lovecraft for me, uh, a lot of people seem like they grew up reading him. It was, he was kind of a part of their like early introduction to genre fiction, um, mm-hmm. specifically horror. That was not the case for me. Um, I he he exists in a way much like what you said. Like I see his influence. I I, I see references to him. I, I I've kind of seen stuff circling around him. I do plan to read some of his stuff in a more academic way, but when when I really started getting into the genre everything i heard was like outlining all the million reasons that he was this like terrible white supremacist asshole like uh you know he famously uh named his cat the n-word and i'm not you know i'm using the euphemism he did not and like he then put that cat in multiple stories named the same thing like wow and and that's just scratching the surface i mean like his mythos is all about like a a white race that is being like terrorized by outsiders so in many ways like it's inescapable right like it's baked into what his stories are about it's about the other the, the the strange to him and he m- turns it into a monster, turns it into a force, and ties it to his cosmic horror. Um, now, the idea of the cosmic horror is massively influential, right? And it's it, particularly a genre I actually enjoy writing in. I have a story uh, coming out in the Overcast podcast later this month that is actually cosmic horror. And uh, in, in many ways, I know that I... I the H.P. Lovecraft's influence has affected even my own work, even though I haven't read him. Um, right. So it's kind of bizarre, like you can't escape it. But the thing that I really enjoy about this book so far, and I and and really I'm sure this project overall, is it's like reclaiming it and changing it and like tying that idea of this sort of like pervasive cosmic horror and like intimately tying it to white supremacy in this book. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that would that would fly like directly in the face of what H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft did. Like it's an inversion of what he did, yeah. and I am loving that. That's all. Yeah, it's awesome so far. It's so funny to see like the the allegory and metaphor that's being drawn to like white privilege, white supremacy, like 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 cult groups and things like that. That okay. that like typically I feel like you're saying in his stories would have been the main characters and the sort of like things going on and, and everything else would be opposing. So we're kind of, like you said, in that way, inverting yeah. it. Foreigners, foreigners were being tied to monsters and like all this stuff. Yeah. Now, like I said, I am not a Lovecraft expert. So this is all stuff I'm getting secondhand. Um, we do actually hope to have on a guest uh, for some later episodes that would bring some more knowledge about H.P. Lovecraft in particular um, mm-hmm. to share with us talking about uh, how it intersects with this project. Um, so it, just depending on scheduling, if we can get it lined up, but we are, you know, fingers crossed, hoping to have that happen. So I'm going to talk about Matt Ruff here in a minute, but before we get into him, I, just like, what are your general thoughts about the story so far? Are you enjoying it? I am really enjoying it. And I wanted to talk about how sort of the Lovecraftian elements and this like systemic racism and all of these things that the lines are blurred in these stories. Mm-hmm. And I think that the way it's interwoven, you can interpret it as, you know, sort of society or this like, like Lovecraftian influence and all of these things. So it, it, there's tension built in, in scenes that are very close to like the black experience or what's, you know, what the author interprets as the black experience in America, specifically in like the fifties like this. Mm -hmm. And the tension from those scenes comes from the racism. And then there's also this like 
background tension from some something else that's unknowable that you yeah. don't really comprehend so far. And I, I'm really enjoying and that. The, and it seems to be allied with that force. That right. it, 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 racism it has supernatural backing in this book. Yeah. Which just makes it even more overwhelmingly terrified than terrifying yeah. than it maybe otherwise would be. Although it's, I don't know that. I mean, arguably, because like often the realist shit is the most terrifying, right? Like the shit that like you know happens is actually the scariest and like most maddening stuff. Exactly. If you take out the Lovecraftian elements, it's still a horror story about oh, the black experience in America. You know. Well, and we're talking about a time period in which it was all out in the open, right? Like now it's more beneath the surface but you know there was this is like a time where they'd have signs that said whites only like they they had these sundown laws which we talk about right. in here they had it, it was baked into society everyone was doing it it seemed like and one of the things that i love about this this book so far is it takes primarily uh takes place primarily in the north um i you know i yeah. kind of thought this might be set in the south but mm-hmm. no, this this is in the north, an area where I think a lot of people today don't realize has just as awful a racist history in many ways. Um, and I, I think that's on full display here. That's something I actually heard Matt Ruff talk about in an interview, how he you know he wanted to show that that uh, racism was everywhere. Um, yeah. it was it wasn't just relegated to the south like many people like to think. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of Matt Ruff, let's talk a little bit about the author because I think this is actually a really interesting point, and we can kind of debate. Um, you know, and uh, not to settle anything, but um, he is a white dude. Um, yeah. who wrote this book. Um, which was well, let, let I, me tell you a little bit about uh, his background. So he's born in 1965 in Queens, New York. He's an American author of thrillers, science fiction, and comic novels, including The Mirage and Lovecraft Country. His family is Lutheran, and he is of German ancestry. Uh, his father was a hosp- hospital chaplain, and his mother was a missionary's daughter. Um, at the, he supposedly wanted to write fiction as early as the age of five. He spent his adolescence learning how to tell stories and, uh, grew into, into being, becoming one as a writer. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a classic, uh, uh, tale of how people become writers, I suppose. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the author of a bunch of different novels I'm seeing here, um, including Fool on the Hill, Sewer Gas Electric, the Public Works Trilogy, Set This House in Order, A Romance of Souls, Bad Monkeys, The Mirage, Lovecraft Country, and 88 Names in 2020. So he is actively writing, actively publishing. And um, I, yeah, like I said, I watched uh, I watched some interviews, read some interviews with him uh, talking about, in particular, what it was like to write this book. Um, and I wanted to read a couple quotes here because I, I thought they were interesting. So he said, I realize that particularly now, the idea of a white author writing about black characters is a particularly fraught subject, says Ruff, who grew up in a multicultural home. But to me, it's just the kind of thing I have always done, and I believe you can succeed at it as long as you take the time to do your research and your, and your job and, you know, get it right. I've had this discussion with other interviewers where they say, wow, the timing of this book could not be better. And the unfortunate thing is that this book and series would seemed would have seemed timely, I think, any time in the past 30 or 40 years, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked about how it does feel like this has come to the surface right now in American politics. But truthfully, it's like it's never really gone away. It's just been varying levels of like in the spotlight. Um, but, yeah, I wanted to circle back on that, like and, and with the full caveats of we're two white dudes, so like. Huge grain of salt. And I honestly, I don't want to belabor this point because I feel like we're not the perspective that really needs to be mentioned, like talking about this at all. But I, it would feel like we weren't covering this thoroughly if we didn't engage with that. I want, I want to talk about it a little bit because this is a big ongoing debate in writing. Like who gets to tell what stories is a mm-hmm. massive subject. And I'm sure that, you know, all of our listeners have their own kind of preconceptions about like what makes sense to them. Um, right. I was surprised when I found out that this book was written by a white man, and um, I am really happy with the idea that it is being developed now by Misha Green and Jordan Peele and has an all-black cast and has been sort of reclaimed in that way. Um, mm-hmm. But it, I personally would feel a little uncomfortable trying to write this book. I'm glad it exists, and I think it's mm-hmm. done. I think it's done good in the world, but it feels like this isn't really his story to tell and you worry that you could be taking away the opportunity of another writer who would want to tell the story whose story it is to tell. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. That was my first reaction is uh, 
when I found out that he was a white author, I was like, oof, that's not really your story to tell. Like you, you don't know the black experience in America in the fifties, yeah. you know, like you, you can do your research as much as you want, but like you could never, you could never comprehend what it would actually have been like. You haven't been put in these situations and you haven't been the person that is actually being affected by it. Um, but like you say, I, I, I think it's well enough done that it's respectful and it's clearly got a certain perspective in mind. Like he's, he's condemning it to the extreme. He's condemning this idea of white supremacy in America. And he's trying to, I don't know if, you know, in some ways it could feel a little like white nighty where it's like, he's like a white guy coming in to tell a black person getting back at the white people uh, after all these years and all that. Um, And there are, there's actually like lampshading of that in the story as well. So mm-hmm. it, I don't know. It's a difficult point because like you said, like I'm enjoying it. I really like that it exists. I like the story. I like the the concept of the story. Um, but it does feel weird that, that it was a white guy who wrote it. Um, yeah. That is to say, like, like you said, huge, huge, like massive deal is Jordan Peele and Misha Green are, are developing it now into the Mm -hmm. show and it's coming out when it is coming out and whether the book was timely or not the show is timely you know like it's coming out now um in 2020 and i don't know like you said i i I don't know that it's really our place to say but to me my first my first reaction was kind of just like it's not his story to tell so if you are a creative getting into writing now this is something that you are going to have to decide for yourself you cannot ignore this because what the question is, are you going to write diverse stories with a diverse cast of characters? And if you are, are you going to write from their points of view? And if you do that, are you going to try and write about what it is like to be a marginalized person? Right. I, I do want to say, I did want to jump in real quick and say, okay. I think you can absolutely write a black character. But this this story to its core is is the black experience in America. So it's like it's like uh, there's uh, there's like a this this story is about black people almost all the way through. Like there's like, you know, there's talk of like ancestors and going through slavery and situations that black people are in in America. It's very much a story that is like from the perspective of a black person. So that's why I kind of felt that way. But I do think that if it's you're you're wanting to write a diverse group of characters in a story, you absolutely can can write a character who isn't white if you're, you know, if I'm a white person, I can write a character that isn't white. I would hope and and like he says, doing your due diligence and trying to maybe, you know, like at least approach people of of said race and ask if they're friends or or someone who could who would be someone who could criticize your work and say like call me on my bullshit like is this is this legit or not right so a lot to talk about there um the last thing you're talking about are um people you you can use people you know but like sensitivity readers are out there and they're invaluable um they typically you do have to hire them and pay them i encourage you to do that um, and you can get people who will read your work and will provide a, a, an angle of, I am the person whose experience you are talking about here. And I can tell you what you've gotten right, what you've gotten wrong. Um, I absolutely encourage people to use them. Um, so circling back on what I was talking about, this is something you're going to have to decide for yourself. Like how comfortable are you? Because there are a lot of people out there and I see this debate on Twitter all the time of like, what, you know, are you able to write these kind of perspectives at all? Or should you completely stay away from them? Um, as a white author, like, should you be relegated to only writing about white people? Should, as a man, should you only be relegated to writing about men? It can get a little bit like, to me, that's the thing that I don't like is it can get really down the rabbit hole of like boxing you into exact, only your exact perspective. Um, so I think the way that most people seem to agree is that like, if you're going to do it, do your research, do your due diligence, and then maybe don't try and tell the story that is. I'm going to tell you what it is like to be a marginalized person rather than I'm telling you a story where a character is a marginalized person and their marginalization is not central to the story. It is maybe a piece of it, but it is not like what the story is about. And and that's what I try and do in my stories. If if I'm going to include characters like this is, yeah, it's like, I want to have a diverse cast, but I'm not going to tell you what the experience is like to be whatever nationality is. Yeah. um, Totally agree. or, 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 Or background to this. So that's where I personally fall. It is something you're going to have to decide as a creative. Um, unfortunately, you can't just wave your hands and say, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. 
because it's impossible. Because then what you're going to end up doing is writing stories that are only filled with white people or people of your background. Um, and, it, you know, and I want to say also, like, if you're a black black writer and you're writing about Asian people's experience or something like this is it's not exclusive to one race. It's just white people are tend to be the worst at it. And also they're the major, majority in, in writing. So um, we're the ones who have to think about it the most, maybe. But everybody has to think about this. So it's something that um, I encourage people to do research on. Um, there's a class called Writing the Other, which I recommend out there, um, who and, and they actually publish a lot of stuff freely available. Um, you look them up, um, who talk a lot about, like, if you're going to do this, how to do it in a respectful way. But I don't want to overly belabor the point, but I just felt like we had to talk about it a little bit here, at least. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you and I are on the same page, but maybe, you know, one maybe one day we'll realize we're in the wrong or something. But yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like we're doing, you know, I think it's do your best to have to show diversity and to to be true to those people and not try to not like you said, not try to like, I don't know, colonize their history or something. You know what right. I mean? And say like this is this is what I say that their history is like or in any way. So. But I, I still, like I said, I, I'm enjoying the story, and I don't want to like ho- like hold it against him. And I think that the, right. the it, I think that it's it's shown that with the adaptation that like I think black voices will be heard through this material. Yeah, um, in, in a way. And he does his research like this. Like you read through it, and like he knows what he's talking about. I can almost guarantee you he used sensitivity readers because it, it feels like he's he's being very cognizant of what he's doing. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I think it's really well done just from my perspective. Although once again, I am not the person maybe <laughs> to make that judgment call. Um, we'll leave, we'll leave it to our listeners. Do write in actually, uh, you know, if you have any thoughts about this particular subject and, you know, we'd be curious to hear them. So wh- he is aware of like how lucky he is to have this show being adapted into an HBO series and how, like how big it is. So I, I wanted mm-hmm. to read one more quote about this. He says, quote, there's a part of me that's just like, what is going to go wrong? Am I going to get hit by a bus? When am I going to get struck by lightning to balance out my good fortune? So far, it's so good, and I couldn't be happier. So he, you know, he, he so I, in the interview I heard him talking about, he actually spoke with Jordan Peele and Misha Green. He got contacted through his agent and said they wanted to have a talk with him after the book came out in 2016. So he agreed, and, and, and the agent said, yeah, so it's this kind of odd. Uh, Jordan Peele wants to talk to you. He's, he's looking to get out of comedy, or not get out of comedy. He's looking to branch into more dramatic work. Um, at the time, he hadn't yet. Right. So he was like, okay, yeah, I'll give it a try. And then he spoke with him. He said it was a great conversation. He felt like they were all clicking and like were talking about the same book, was his quote, that it, it often doesn't happen. Um, and he felt great about the conversation. And then like a few months later... Um, Get Out came out and uh, he was like, oh, I see now. <laughs> like, I see what direction he's going in. Um, and then, of course, that was followed by us later on. And and then now, you know, Jordan Peele isn't the showrunner for this, but the, the idea that he would want to produce it and be involved, um, it all ties into the kind of stories he's telling now. And, uh, you know, it, it just seems like a you know a perfect fit to me. Yeah, I mean, and like what he's created is struck a chord with all audiences and, you um it's 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 like you said it's really cool to see him also bringing other people up with him as he you know as he's like on this jet stream straight to the top it's it's been really awesome to see all right so we're going to start getting into the actual stories covered we read lovecraft country dreams of the witch house and abdullah's book the first three uh stories in the book that, that cover about half of the page count um, I'm going to read a summary of the story itself, and then we'll just talk about that one. We'll move through each of the three stories. So obviously we'll be spoiling everything for these stories. So Lovecraft Country, the opening story. Atticus Turner, working in Florida after leaving the army, returns home to Chicago after receiving a mysterious letter from his estranged father Montrose, saying he had left Chicago to go to Artem, Massachusetts, where he believed he would find some sort of information about Atticus's mother's family previously unknown to them. Atticus, his Uncle George, and his childhood friend Letitia drive from Artem to find Montrose. They are chased, accosted, and nearly murdered by racists on the way. Once at Artem, they find a large manor house called the Artem Lodge. Atticus learns that he is the descendant of the lodge's founder, Titus Braithwaite. Montrose is being held hostage, chained up in a basement. The current owner of the house, Samuel Braithwaite, is planning a ceremony with all the members of his lodge, a sect of sorcerers called the Order of the Ancient Dawn, during which he needs Braithwaite descendant to be a conduit for some ancient power. Presumably this will kill Atticus. 
Caleb Braithwaite, Samuel's only son, is also in attendance, and he secretly instructs Atticus with an incantation to say during the ceremony. Atticus does this, and it causes the unleashed power to consume Samuel and all the members of the lodge and turn them to dust while protecting Atticus. Caleb releases Atticus, George, Montrose, and Letitia, and lets them leave to go back to Chicago. Ooh, okay, so yes, that that was the opening story, which is like, you know, it introduces us to all the characters that we're going to be dealing with later on and is the introduction to this world. So there's a lot to talk about here, uh, yeah. backing all the way up to, you know, the air, the introduction of Atticus, um, yeah. the sci-fi fantasy loving uh, main character, which I immediately felt a fondness for. Uh, the references are going like flying a million miles a second. Plenty of sci-fi sci-fi writers that we've covered, but uh, yeah. Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, right? Princess of Mars, and and he's talking about Tarzan and all these books. Um, mm-hmm. He talks about Ray Bradbury, which we covered with Fahrenheit 451, um, you know, and others. Um, and and this is something that I thought was you know smart in many ways. Like you're always you you know readers love to read about re- other readers, right? So it's yeah. automatically going to make us interested. We're reading a horror book. And this guy mm-hmm. is, you know what I mean? Like he's into horror fiction. He's into sci-fi and all this stuff. So what's the Scientology guy's name? Oh, yeah. Um, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. He he. like I love the part where he was like, yeah, he didn't really like L. Ron Hubbard, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that was something I wanted to talk about. And I, I heard Matt Ruff mention in an interview as well. Um, Atticus loves a genre that doesn't love him back, as particularly mm-hmm. in this time period. It was incredibly difficult to be a black fan of these writers because so many of them, you know, had problematic stuff in their writing. We talked about it with Edgar Rice Burroughs, right? Like it was a Confederate soldier, which is mentioned directly in this book. Like his father goes, you know, he's a Confederate soldier, right? That you're reading about. And he kind of, and like, he doesn't really have an answer for that Atticus. And, um, that just shows like the complex nature of fandom. And I really like that. It's like, even 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 black fans are are having to look past things, you know, much like, like we try to do on this podcast, like we're trying to engage with the work and like we, we, we you know, identify where there's problem areas, but then we're trying to talk about reasons to like it. But like for many people, it's just a deal breaker. And that's how it is for his father. He's like, you can't like this author, you know, and here's like all these reasons why. Um, mm-hmm. And Atticus just has to draw a different line. It seems like some authors he does still really enjoy, but he even talks about like H.P. Lovecraft. He's like, yeah, I couldn't do it. H.P. Lovecraft is just too far gone. He's too racist. Yeah, yeah, and that that kind of comes around to why the like certain areas called Lovecraft Country and and like the yeah. idea of and that's what the obviously what the story is called and so that like it's holds used a lot in of weight. A few different ways, which I thought was really cool. Um, but yeah, in general, he's talking about so they hear about this Artem town and he thinks he at first he mistakes it and thinks that it is actually a specific fictional town from a lovecraft story but it's not um and but i love that he's kind of playing like blurring the lines there because it is a fictional town um and then you know he talks about like oh that's out in lovecraft country um likening that area to being incredibly racist right so it's like shorthand for incredibly racist white people um yeah but then he also like later on mentions like maybe we're everywhere is Lovecraft country. And then he also talks about like at times he's like, and, and uh, when, when there's a bookshelf and like down on the lower shelf, there's like Lovecraft story. So he's like, yeah, down there's Lovecraft country. So like he uses it all the time for like yeah. different reasons and it's really fun. Uh, yeah. Using it in different ways, which, which I thought was fun for sure. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about Atticus like early on because his, mm-hmm. he's like, uh, when we first meet him, he's by himself driving out of the South and um yeah a lot of crazy stuff goes down he gets pulled oh over. yeah so many like racist and then like police man yeah that's police. just the thing that like it's 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 the racism has authority right in the form of mm-hmm. police and that's why it's particularly dangerous and the way they just harass and make up bullshit reasons and you know it's like the idea and, and the thing that like is so heartbreaking but like uh, totally understandable is how atticus knows like the idea of like you're driving down the road and you and you see flashing lights behind you and he's going to reach over and pull out all of his information and set it on the seat because right. he knows that he's going to be asked for it and he doesn't want to reach for the glove compartment. Yep. And like that's terrifying. It's something as a white dude I would never think to do because mm-hmm. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like I'm not worried that I'm going to be shot by the police like that. Um, you know, and it's just it's 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 crazy that that's still going on today and I can't even imagine what it was like back then. Um, and then yeah, just the way he's like he, they know how to like interact with the police in a way to try and keep themselves safe. They're trying to do so many things, trying to be respectful, you know, saying mm-hmm. sir and all this stuff. When when the when the guy is just being a huge asshole and like p- racist piece of shit with a badge who has is on a power trip and just harassing and 
you know, asking them like how they afforded this car or what are they doing in this part of town? You're not allowed to be here. Or you're not supposed to be here. And just, you know, it's just, it was so maddening, right? It yeah. Was There's also the section furying. where he, they, they're talking about like the sundown laws, like you, were, you yeah. mentioned earlier. And it's like, he has to get out of a certain, t- he's trying to drive through to get yep. to his destination. And, and like this cop pulls him over and basically is trying to hold him up. He has like nine minutes to get out of the town or the county, whatever yeah, it and is. And he says that they legally could hang him. If right. he was there, which is yep. fucking incredible. And then as he gets to the, he gets through, he, the cop follows him the whole way, right on his tail the entire time. He doesn't, he has to make sure he doesn't break any laws, no speeding, under the speed limit, yeah. gets through, gets through to the next state or to the next county or whatever. And then the cop pulls out a rifle and like shoots out his like Still back shoots windshield. Out, and yeah. Stuff. yeah. And then what about when he was like getting ready to go and he like asked him, he's like, actually, is it legal to do a U-turn here? And like, exactly. He's like, it's a good thing you asked that because it's not, but I'll allow it. And that's, Man, it's, it's like it's fucking wild, and you just know that this kind of shit happened too. It's like this this stuff is like yeah, this exact scenario is fictional, but it's based off of a million real real life. Well, I mean, and like Tulsa Tulsa's brought up in this story, which yeah. is something that was like new to me in like 2019, 2020 because of Watchmen, yeah. and like I, I, it's something that we should have learned in school, we never learned, and just like like the the. Uh, the, if we know that this, these things happen because there are historical events like Tulsa where these things are like full hatred just like led to mass burnings and killings and yeah one of the one of the darkest chapters in American history honestly and that was on full display in Watchmen I agree I didn't know a lot about it you know to my shame and now yeah. I know more and 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 I want to also mention we covered James Baldwin um with if Bill yeah. Street could talk and like that was super eye opening to me too and learning about him and like ever since I learned about him I feel like I've been seeing quotes from him everywhere um and it, it's funny how that happens right like you you become aware of something and then all of a sudden you see it everywhere. He's Although, everywhere. I, I also wonder sometimes if there's algorithm shit going on. Like, <laughs> like the algorithm has identified that I know who this is. <laughs> but we know from that uh, that episode how how important James Baldwin was, just like for we, as a cultural figure, as all of that, yeah. like civil rights activist. No, absolutely. Thank you for bringing um, it back to my original point. <laughs> I was yeah. getting in the weeds. No, yeah, right. And I was trying to say that, like, yeah, it just. I, I feel like I'm way more aware of this now than I ever was, and um, I feel like it really helped me go into this book and like have mm-hmm. a perspective. Well, the second story, there, there are like parallels to uh, if Beale Street could talk for me. We'll, we'll get there oh, really? when we get there. Okay, but the yeah, sort we'll, of like, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. So one of the things I really loved, and you kind of mentioned it with the Tulsa stuff, was at one point they look at this map. Um, so there's this guidebook they have that is like it's kind, it's a fictional guidebook, the version they have, but it's based off of a real book, the Green Book, uh, which mm-hmm. was really used. Um, this like was published uh, where it was like where you could go safely as a black person mm-hmm. dr- traveling. And um, one of the, one of the parts that I thought was really interesting was when he looks at this map that has been drawn of a lot of these areas, and it's drawn in like the style of a Middle Earth like fantasy map. It has yeah. tr- ogres and trolls, and like there's castles and stuff, and it's just like keying into me how how this story is going to go in some ways. And then Tulsa in particular is said to have like a great white dragon wrapped around it, breathing fire. Um, it's like the you know like the, the worst place you could go, and all this stuff like. I don't know. I thought that was all really incredible and setting up. He like slowly sets up the supernatural through references to to stuff like this. Right. Like signifying that this story is going to be a little bit different. And that also reminded me um, something we talk about a lot on this show is story seeds. Like, where does the story come from? And that was something Matt Ruff talked about in, in, a, in an interview. He said that his initial idea for the story, he actually pitched it to be a television series. And the pitch was he wanted it to be an X-Files-like anthology series following Atticus Turner, who was going around the country and trying to investigate supernatural events, all Mm -hmm. while trying to be a black man in, like, 1950s America. That Mm -hmm. was, like, his initial concept for this was always going to be sort of an anthology-type show. And I think that's why we get the book we get, where it kind of is an anthology style of, of novel. I I really respect um, these this form of storytelling like anthology. It's not it's not even necessarily an anthology, right? It's sort of a like monster of the week continuation X Files. Yeah, kind of thing. I'm using the terms interchangeably, but yeah, that's right. what I mean. So, yeah. So the idea of of saying like I'm going to create a world and then tell a beginning, middle, and end every single you know every chapter or something mm-hmm. like that you're telling you're telling that many stories you know what yeah, i mean you so have to you, it feels like a lot of work honestly it's like oh man i have to write a beginning middle and end for each of these 
Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so like I, I and I find it to be really interesting the way you can thread in sort of like references or like homo- like um, homages to other stories or sort of like um, foreshadowing, like all that yeah. kind of stuff. And, and I've, read a, I've read a few books like this um, and I'm struggling to name them all. But I, one in particular really jumps out. And that's The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is one of my favorite books ever. And it's a series of stories about uh, a, a Vietnam War veteran and, and his experiences in Vietnam and then also his experiences coming back to America afterwards. And it's like this, like each each chapter is a self-contained story, but they all link together. Oh, we covered one with Jesus' son. Also kind of like this, right? Like yeah. this is a thing that you often see in like the literary world, but it's interested to see it brought into this sort of genre fiction. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, and I, I think it's going to make for some really interesting for a really interesting show. Also, like it's it's set yeah. up perfectly to be really. It fun seems show. like it'll lend itself perfectly to a TV show for sure. Whether it's one episode or two episodes, they'll have little arcs within the season. I think that'll be really fun. Yeah, so this story progresses, and things get weirder and weirder, right? Like, uh, there, there's as they get closer to Artem, um, it seems like the supernatural elements get get even more severe, and then um, it it sort of. Really, the the first time something like really, truly supernatural, I I think, happens is when the the sheriff is like taking them out into the woods to shoot them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this quote unquote grizzly bear (laughs) starts like killing some of the deputies and stuff. Um, And but it's also like implied that it's not a grizzly bear. You never really see it. And this is the very Lovecraftian stuff of like, it's just it's like on the edge of vision. It's weird sounds you hear. It's it's all this stuff trees are being felled in the forest and stuff so it's not it can't be a grizzly bear like it's got to be something massive and like and then it's also silent and that's this it's like they're searching for something that's like it must be a grizzly bear there's no other explanation you know where it's it's something else yep Um, and oh and they're also being followed by this silver car that seems like somehow magical in a way because it's like the way it it behaves and the way yeah yeah, but disappears and reappears and is always watching and um all this stuff you know so well so and there's also the the part where the police, as they're like luring them into the woods and taking them out there to basically shoot them, uh, they're distracted by something over by the cars. Come to find out, it was Letitia, mm-hmm. and uh, so they run back. But then when we also go back with our characters, our main characters, we see like just carnage, and there's just like car the cars are on fire and stuff. But the police are slashed open, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so. Yeah, crazy stuff happened there. <laughs> crazy stuff happening. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, let, this is Letitia being a badass, which uh, you know she continues to be. Love her. Mm-hmm. Um, really interested to see where where a lot of these characters go. Honestly, um, they're all so interesting, right? Like the I love the the sort of interpersonal family stuff going on with with Atticus and his father and with George. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we don't even get to Montrose until a little bit later, but um. I, I think it's like hilarious and in a way that all of this was started by a father who was trying to look into his family's genealogy and like mm-hmm. dig into the history of it because like I don't know about you but like this is often it's something that like my, you know something my parents have done you know it's something that a lot of people's yeah. parents I think go out and start digging into family history and so I like the idea that he dug into it and it was like there was a horror awaiting there which you know sometimes you find out some shit you didn't want to know yeah I mean, yeah, definitely a metaphor being drawn there. Yeah. Uh, he's also like like picking up on like almost like conspiracy theories that are going on slash cult like stuff yeah. going on. Like he's like he's really started to like pick up on all that. And I think it's at the end of this story we learn that um, he's like gone off with some white person that he met in a in a in like a diner or something. He just like has been missing. You talking about Montrose? Montrose, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he, he, it, we end up finding out that it was um, Caleb Braithwaite, right? He's the youngest. Right. Um, yep. And he, he, it, ended up, it ended up being him. Um, and I like his explanation he gives, too, of like, I knew he was up to no good, but I, I thought that as long as I knew he was up to no good, I could go along with it and I would be fine. You know, like, that's such a, I don't know, I, I felt like I, I really sympathized with that viewpoint of like as long as i know this guy's up to no good and i go along with it you know i'll be fine but i can handle you were not fine (laughs) you wound up in a basement eventually they uh god there's another uh the the police interaction that they get that's the police interaction that they get coming into the the sort of area the lovecraft country area yeah and then they get up to this spooky they get up to the spooky house their windows are all smashed out and everything like that 
uh, because of the the cops basically just like trashing their car mm-hmm. and all the stuff that went on with Letitia and and like some sort of Lovecraftian creature, and then they finally get their car to this location that they're trying to get to. And it's and, this massive um, lodge, right? <laughs> like it's super fancy and uh, it's got, got definitely got a little bit of like get out vibes to it. Is what I was picking okay. up on is like like something is not right. There's like white people like bowing to the yeah. to the black Willi- people. William like, the uh, the servant who just yeah. seems like overwhelmingly gracious and not and you're like mm, i don't know if i trust this yeah guy. you guys are there's something there's something afoot yeah and, and of course there ends up being i do also like how the characters are not dumb ever like they they yeah. know like they're like mm-hmm. from the get though they're like something is wrong here um mm-hmm. they're trying to like get what enjoyment they can out of it like with the letitia like wanting to take the dresses and stuff but they're kind of of the of the it's in the mode of like well let's take some shit with us when we have to flee here because we're gonna have to run soon you know yeah, like they know something's sure. bad from the jump I, I really like how it come it kind of full circles with uh, Atticus's character where he he's like the books sh- like the, the the rooms that they're given are just like these lavish rooms. His is mm-hmm. like a library. Hers is like has like a spa in it, basically mm-hmm. like a giant tub. Um, and uh, Atticus like is going through all of the books that they have, and it's like everything that he loves. It's like we talked about Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's got like all of the uh all the sci-fi writers everything like that and then he finds this one book and he he does some reading and that that ends up being sort of the key to the story yeah you're talking about the uh the book that describes the religion of of yeah. this this cult yeah mm-hmm. uh no good whenever you start getting into these uh old white power cult i mean it's very ku klux klan it's very yeah. um I don't know. Grandmasters and shit. Yeah, like the idea that they're like, like wizards and stuff, I thought yeah. was hilarious. It's like he's taking these like real things that these, you know, old assholes call themselves and literalizing it because they like actually do have power here. Um one thing I was picking up on is a lot of the powers that are demonstrated by these people are sort of kind of like you could almost interpret them as like their white privilege given magical ability. Yeah. Like totally, when, when yeah. I thought about how uh, Caleb has the power to imbue his car to be invisible to police, I was like, it's his white privilege power and he grants it to them. <laughs> exactly. Jumping ahead to the end, like he he puts that on their car and now they can go anywhere without being seen. And it's like that's like, you know, white privilege helping helping out yeah. and like you're you know i don't know it was really interesting because clearly that's like the that's like the moment where it's like that's a one-to-one that's white privilege yeah in it, it at its core well and um we see later on that like he loves to use police um i thought it was interesting that like he's immune to harm in a way that seems like mm-hmm. white privilege is like his armor protecting him i don't know there, i was kind of yeah. reading into it here and there it's maybe not a perfect one-to-one all the time but it, it seemed like he was playing with that idea it's also it's playing on like that society which you know this is still white privilege but it's the idea that like i'm untouchable and like he probably you probably could punch him in the face and affect him maybe not in this story i I, you know we don't yet to be seen at least as far as we know they're talking about like i'm untouchable you can't you can't touch me well in in real life you're untouchable because the law protects you no matter what against no matter what you've done the law protects you because you're white against you know, a black person trying to commit violence against you, right? No matter how much you deserve it. And he, and they have like literalized that and turned it into a magic for these characters. Um, but yeah, I think it does stem from that. So the elder Braithwaite, who is this like, he's this like relic of an old world. He's trying to have this big cult, like, you know, ceremony where they're going to summon this light of creation. And this is all very Lovecraftian, right? And from what I understand. And, um, Essentially, there's a coup staged by the younger Braithwaite who supplies Atticus with something to to recite so that he protects himself from this light of creation, which kills everyone else in, in the resulting chaos. And it's a coup that he's um, the younger Braithwaite is able to take over. And that was interesting, too, because it's like the I, I like the idea of like the racism being passed along. It's like generational and like like he's taking it and using it in a way. And he's like. I don't know. It's like it, it. I feel like it's trying to say something about the way that this the, the the racism passes on through the generations and how people have like a different relationship with it, but they still mm-hmm. love the power that it grants yeah. them. You know, clearly, I could, I thought Caleb had ulterior motives, but at first, I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, this white guy helped helped these black people who've been you yeah. know ha- had all these awful things happen, and to he him. continues. To and do so, it. like, they're playing with that. They're playing yeah. with that. Clearly, like, it, it, as as the stories go on, there are more ulterior like ulterior mo- motives at play, and um, but it's this idea of white people using black people for their benefit. Exactly. You know, like, oh, for sure. Even even though he does something to help them 
ulterior yeah. motives. It's to progress his own agenda, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a continuing thing is like, yeah, he seems to be helpful in all these ways, but he always is doing it to benefit himself. Which, like um, you say, could be seen as like the next generation of, of racism. You know, it's not the yeah. out and out racism. It's the it's like the oh, no, I'm helping you. But at the yeah. same time, you do like for your own benefit. Exactly. Um, so this story was great. Um, I, I, you know, I was so hooked into the world here. Um, and then our, and then our characters leave and I, and I was kind of like, oh man, I, I hope we're not going to get like a complete change of scenery and, and all new characters and stuff. So I was pleased to, to, to find out that we were going into another story with Letitia at the center. So the next story is called Dreams of the Witch House, which by the way, um, I've been told is a direct reference to a Lovecraft story called Dreams of the Witch House, W-I-T-C-H, whereas this is W-H-I-C-H. Um, so I, I haven't read that story, so I, 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 you know, I don't know exactly in what ways it's engaging with it, but I assume that there is a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume that we're, we're missing a lot of Lovecraft, like, like direct references, um, yeah, probably. just cause we, we don't have the experience with it. Uh, but I do, I, I do feel like there's something, there's like kind of a, a click every once in a while where I'm like, that's probably a reference. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can, you can feel it. Your spidey sense tingling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So here's what happens in the story. Letitia receives an inheritance of sorts from her late father, a notorious gambler, and uses it to buy, in a white neighborhood, a large 14-bedroom house called the Winthrop House, named for after the original owner, Hiram Winthrop, which was being sold cheap due to it being haunted. Letitia plans on fixing it up and renting the rooms. After moving in, she realizes that the house is haunted by Winthrop's ghost, who is not too happy about sharing it with, with new residents. He and Letitia struggle as he nearly kills her until she convinces him that if he does, she will stay as a ghost and haunt him back. After that, they come to an agreement and even find some peace over their shared love of playing games like chess. Letitia never sees Winthrop, but his piece of pieces moving on their own. Meanwhile, the white folks in the neighborhood quickly begin harassing Letitia because they don't want black people living there, swearing at her, vandalizing the car of one of her friends, threatening her, and throwing manure at her front door. One night, three young men break in with intentions to burn the house down. Winthrop's ghost intervenes and hauls the men down to the basement, where they are locked in terror until the police arrive. Later, Atticus discovers that Caleb Braithwaite arranged for the sale of the house to Letitia. Okay, so there is story number two. Uh, haunted house story, which was definitely a change of pace, than, um, well, yeah, but, but through the lens of racism and stuff. So, uh, you know, yeah, really cool. So I was talking about the connection to Beale Street, if Beale Street could talk and the, the, the idea of needing a white person for the, to assist them in order to buy a home or to buy, yeah. you know, somewhere to live. And um, how, especially in this time period, I, I'm sure it still happens now in, in ways, you know, I'm sure there's still racism within this, the system. Oh, absolutely. There was an article released and recently I saw where, um, uh, it was an interracial couple, a white man and a, and a black woman, and they had um, published uh, pictures of their home that included family photos that showed the two of them together, um, and they were getting like certain um, offers that were well below what they thought they should be getting, and then they, as an experiment, republished them later and like removed all the photos that showed her in any of it, and it they got offers that went lined up right with where it should have been according to the market. So it was like this direct showing of like the fact that a black person lived there was like lowering the property value. So Crazy. this shit absolutely still goes on. Yeah. Um, and the connection is there from, from uh, if Beale Street could talk, like I was saying, the, the, um, the other thing that I really liked about this story though, is this idea of exposure. Like this, this ghost is a racist ghost. Yeah. And, and probably never interacted with a black person before. You know what I mean? Like this idea of experiencing and like under coming to an understanding with someone, um, and and having exposure to someone that's not a white person in in you know 1950s America made this ghost realize like, oh, we actually have things in common. We can yeah. we can like seemingly and then seemingly yeah and then you know still going to be a racist ghost, but at the same time like there's like a there's a, a bond that's formed there. And then, and yeah. then when people They're come like to destroy the house other and stuff, yeah. yeah, when people come to destroy the house, maybe in the self-interest of the house, but also because like it's a, 
Letitia's house now. He protects the house. Yeah, well, and it also shows, like, on Letitia's side, that she has to endure this racism and win over this ghost, but she's willing to do it. You know what I mean? So, like, there's a strength Mm -hmm. there, and, like, I admire the character for doing that, but it's, like, she shouldn't have to do that. Right. So it's also also tragic in that sense, but, you know, that's something that black people are used to doing, like, having to overcome the racism and find common ground with people who don't want to find it with you. And just like on a on a day to day basis, have to deal with neighbors who are who are like yeah. antagonistic. Like where you live, the place that you f- should feel safe. Um, having people just like just glaring at you and fucking with your house, and you know what I mean. Like it's just it, it, kind that's of on stuff clear that display at the end of the story, right? When the police show up um, to to investigate what happened, and like they don't believe that Letitia owns the house at all, and then like they even they finally like they think they're the help, right? Multiple times. And then Atticus, they're finally like, okay, so you own this place. And he's like, no, I don't. Like, because he's a man, he gets like a little bit more benefit of the doubt from them. So like, even though the police show up to investigate, it's like, they're still just, the police are just awful in this, in these books. And like, you know, it's something that's, I don't think I would have been prepared for until this year, you know, where I like my opinion of the police has, has honestly like completely changed. Um, just because of the, the ongoing brutality we've seen and just like so many examples. And I know this is something that's been going on a long time and I've just been sort of protected from it or like blind to it. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I'm totally on board with the way that police are p- portrayed in this book, honestly, because it feels yeah. spot on. I mean, yeah, we're seeing it. It's like every day you turn the news on on, on the news and you're seeing yeah. it. Um, I'm sure not the... every single poli- officer out there, but you, it, it's it's like the systematic problem of it is is on full right. display. Uh, the other thing that I liked is the characterization of Letitia. We get to see, I guarantee that this characterization comes back, her, her like unwillingness to, to waver in like the things she wanted to do, which was stay in the house. And, uh, Ruby, her sister leaves because she doesn't, she just like, isn't interested in trying to, trying to fight it out. Um, and she does and she stays and she overcomes it and like, like you said, not something she should have to go through, but she, she, you know, persists nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now, I, now as a dog lover, I also love the inclusion of the Charlie boy, German shepherd who, yeah. uh, Troy boy junior, I think his name is. I just loved him. Like this, the German shepherd scared the shit out of these white assholes. Um, but then is afraid of the ghost and in kind of a funny way, but I also felt like it kind of helped a little bit with the, in the, cause in the first story, there's a bunch of dogs that, uh, <laughs> don't get treated very well because they're being employed by these, this cult and, and Atticus has to hit one with a shovel, I think at one point and all this shit. So I felt like it, it helped a little bit of like, showing that like dogs aren't racist inherently it's racist owners who yeah. you know are using them as a tool unfortunately um and you know i love that she has this german shepherd who is like there to protect her and listens to her you know it, it was awesome yeah so uh let's talk about the ominous fact that caleb braithwaite was involved in the sale and everything yeah so that that's revealed at the end um that that he was involved in the sale and we don't know why like what what the purpose of that is other than maybe just like further ties he's 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 making here between him and this and this group um it it definitely seems shady there's some interesting power like there's a moment and i know it's like meant to make us think this but there's the moment when atticus confronts this other this person who sold the house to to letitia and um he's confronting him in the hallway and he's trying to squeeze by and they're just talking about like i know about caleb uh braithwaite i know about this 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 and as he's getting into the elevator it's like and then he disappeared like a ghost and it's because like you know the elevator doors closed and he disappeared you know he's gone Mm -hmm. like a ghost but at the same time it's like is that guy like a fucking ghost is that some (laughs) sort of like caleb braithwaite power that he can like like uh, astrally project something or yeah playing with the idea of this being a ghost story too i think yeah in, in that particular moment all right, you ready for story number three? Yeah, National Treasure. Yeah, National Treasure. Uh, yeah, the the heist story of the book that that I really it was really a lot of fun. Honestly, it was probably the most yeah. fun. I mean, honestly, there's been fun to be had throughout, and that's one of the things I I was kind of surprised at, like there, that there was a good amount of humor. Um, but this whole thing was just like a, a really hilarious heist scheme being being carried out. That was a lot of fun. Each story to me is kind of taking on its own sort of genre within like uh, mm-hmm. this. This story to me felt like sort of like I was joking, like National Treasure Adventure story where like they find these clues and it's on the back of the Declaration of Independence and <laughs> yeah, this exactly. book and like they they're in a museum and then they delve down into find this crazy place that nobody knew was under yeah. this museum. And let me read the uh, let me read the summary here. So this is for Abdullah's book. 
Caleb Braithwaite blackmails George and Montrose to break into a natural history museum and retrieve a secret book hidden behind magical incantations set to protect it. They bring along a couple of members of the Prince Hall Freemasons, a lodge George and Montrose belong to, for help, Abdullah Muhammad and Pirate Joe, the lodge master. Abdullah nearly dies in the attempt, but the men are able to retrieve the book. Caleb honors his deal with the men. It's the Book of Names, once owned by Hiram Winthrop. He delivers to them the book he stole from them, along with a sizable amount of money. Okay, so this this story starts out by talking about um, Montrose's, I think, great-great-grandmother's book, um, where she had been like logging and, and, and tracking all of the um, debts owed to her by her by her owners because she was a slave and like you know when she got whipped she was like this is how much you owe me for this this is the work i did this day this is what you owe me for this and she was like totaling it all up and then this has been an heirloom that has been passed along um through the generations we find out and then now it's gone missing yeah i mean really affecting that that part i felt like was like the grounding of the stories like the history there and like the 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 absolute just like atrocities that happened mm -hmm. and um the unpaid debt that is owed you know what I mean? This this yeah. idea that like th black people endured this and then they still are enduring, you know, ongoing yeah. racism, ongoing things every day. Um, and it's just like unpaid in their ledger. You know what I mean? It's just like nothing will ever make it right is what I'm yeah. trying to say. You know, that's the thing, too, because I mean, just to circle to the end, like they get the money at the end. He includes this 300,000 almost as an afterthought. And he's like, hey, there's a little bonus I'm gonna throw in for you. I'm gonna pay that off. And it also shows like how like it's better than nothing like, you know, and I think this is engaging with the idea of like reparations. Right. Right. And it's like, yeah, it's good to get this money, but it doesn't it doesn't actually, you know, uh, make anything. I don't know. It, like it doesn't it doesn't uh, absolve them of guilt. It doesn't it doesn't erase the harm that was done. It's just like a little something. You right. know, it's like the least he could do and in that sense. You know what I mean? I think that's what it's engaging with. And I think it's also interesting that Caleb, again, Caleb Braithwaite is, is trying to, in, in some way, maybe absolve is some, you know, something that, that like, I, I just see this as like your, your modern day sort of closeted racist seeing it yeah. as like, if reparations are paid, then everything's, everything's good now and everything would be back to normal. Yeah. He, he's trying to befriend them, right? Like he's trying yeah. to make them feel more like on his side. And you know, I, I think the money is just a drop in the bucket to him too. It's like, yeah. he's become so wealthy off of this shit that it's like, Oh yeah, I can just casually throw you this money. It's no big deal to me. Um, yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. So, so, but to circle back to the story itself, like the, the heist. And then they, they find this like, bizarre tunnel that seems to go somewhere where it shouldn't be able to go and they get to a secret zero g room with a floating chest and like a skeleton that's like an orbit around it and it's like it's really cool like i really like they lean into the supernatural stuff here um the character mortimer was was not mentioned in that summary but uh, i think he's really interesting because he's this like little nerdy guy who's like over prepared and he's brought a bag full of stuff and um, mm -hmm. the, he ends up being the one who gets tossed because he's light. They're yeah. like, oh, we can throw well, you. in a very, <laughs> in a very adventure like, like scene, you know, like yeah, that, that like, scene tie happens, ropes right? to his ankle and his wrist or something. And the reluctant one who's like smaller and they like, they force him to do it even though he doesn't want to. And he gets out there and this like crazy ass torpedo thing. Yeah. Weird torpedo dragon thing that's flying around and like eating the rope and, and, uh, comes at him at one point. Um, th this is an exciting this is what maybe one of the most exciting sequences is for, to read, honestly, just from like an action point of view. Like it was thrilling. There was danger. It was um, it was just it was funny. Um, and then, yeah, they, they, they do finally figure out that there's like a button they can press that rules that reels the chest in after the fact. Mm -hmm. And they're able to get the book out. But um, after after a lot of uh, hijinks ensue in that room, which were I, I hope we get to see this exact scene in, in, in an episode. I think it'd be a lot of yeah. fun. That would be a lot of fun. It's it, it reminds me of like um, in uh, Indiana Jones when when he has to like cross the invisible bridge and it's yeah. like you have to like believe in this thing that you don't really necessarily believe in. But like this like floating room and all like, to get to the chest to get to the thing. It's like very Indiana Jones like adventure story kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really fun. Uh, so then, yeah, they get back. And then, of course, I, you know, Braithwaite, his his henchmen are police and i think that's like a, a particularly saying something right like he could just have two hired guns threatening to do violence but he doesn't he has detectives along who are threatening to do violence and are essentially thugs at his beck and call 
with the added layer of they have authority granted to them by society. And they even threaten, they're like, you're trespassing, we're going to arrest you for it. So they have this like added layer that they're able to, to to bring to bear of anything of like, they're also untouchable. That's the thing that's like about police. It's like, you can't do anything to me. I am literally untouchable to you. Um, and so even though they're breaking the law themselves and they're doing something that is lawless and, and villainous, they are in a sense untouchable. So um, yeah. I think he's very deliberately choosing policemen to be his henchmen here. Yeah. And in the end, um, the two books are traded, right? So the book that they that they got from this crazy adventure and the book that Caleb Braithwaite had stolen from their from their like lockbox or whatever in the at the bank, uh, the exchange is made and Caleb now has this like book that was protected by all this magical shit. And like, who knows what he's going to be able to do with that? in the future yeah like or what that means for for the yeah, story he going gets, forward he, and he unfortunately does get this magic book yeah that's going to increase his power so once again you you've demonstrated <laughs> uh he is in it for himself he has his own gains in mind and he you know is willing to sink to the to these depths of like using this the, this heirloom against them um and threaten them and and everything else and it's like he's he's it, yeah it's really interesting how he's both doing all of that but then also like giving him the money and like it, it, trying mm. to like keep their relationship not being fully antagonistic um I, and i just also love how the our characters see through that like they know what he's doing yeah. you know what i mean yeah and you know I, I feel like they're going to accept the money i guess we haven't seen for sure yet i don't know what they're going to do with it but like they're going into it knowing that there are strings attached to it so i'm sure it's going to be kind of tricky yeah i actually feel like this is a good spot if you want to do you want to try to like pick up on some of the connections or threads that are going to be going pulling us through the rest of the stories? Yeah, like you're talking about like predictions. <laughs> yeah, predictions. Like what? Like what? Obviously, Caleb is going to continue to play a part. But do you yeah, have any sort? I of... think he's the central villain essentially of this story. Um, I think his power is going to increase over time as he becomes, you know, probably he's probably trying to ascend to a Lovecraftian god level of power, mm -hmm. right? And um, yeah it's going to continue to interweave with these stories where he's involving these characters. It does seem like some power is being granted to them too. So, you know, whether that's, whether that's, you know, magical or, or financial or what have you. So, you know, is that power he's granting them going to be useful in the, in the struggle to come? I, I assume it probably will be. We didn't talk, talk a ton about like the abilities that we, that we could assume that Atticus can have because he's related to so-and-so that, that that's was true. Yeah, he's 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 like distantly related to the Braithwaites, right? Like, because that's the whole thing right. is that like the great great mother, mother grandmother in tr in question fled from the house during this original fire, which in a very Lovecraftian way was described to have like all of the imaginable colors and then some um, mm -hmm. when it all burned down, right? Like, like yeah. beyond imagining, um, is something something crazy went down, and then she fled um, with this book, um, and she I, the assumption is she was pregnant with a with a braithwaite uh baby who was like the distant ancestors of them um coming all it's, the way down to atticus being the the youngest now in the line yeah and when samuel has that conversation samuel being the oldest braithwaite that we meet in the story mm -hmm. when he has that conversation with atticus he says like you are the closest to the like original ancestor who was like the most powerful so you are the most powerful and then he says you know he goes on to say racist shit like although you are tainted and this and that yeah, you yeah, are you're the most powerful so so he'll be he'll be I'm sure that he'll have some abilities going forward or some some yeah. some role to play well, in that well way. because in some ways too like as much as this is a Lovecraft story it's also being tied I think to a lot of these other authors being referenced right like in many ways it is kind of a fantasy story it's got wizards it's got dragons it's got you know it doesn't have mm -hmm. actual dragons yet but you know what I mean like it's got monsters and magic and so I'm you know I think he's going to continue to play with these different genres and these different tropes of storytelling and yeah I agree I think we are going to see Atticus start to to unlock an inner power um and, and it's going to be interesting though because that t power is going to have this fraught history although i guess that's that's stuff that's been explored in fantasy too so maybe we'll get kind of like a fantasy type story surrounding him and his his you know he, he'll have like sorcerer powers yeah. or something i i do love that like the supernatural elements are are like definitely a part of the story but the biggest horrors come from like we've talked about like the, the like systematic race racism the like um everyday micro and macro aggressions that are yeah. going on that like it, it's like those that's the real horror and evil of the story so th that that it that provides most of the the tension and terror 
Yeah. So we're going to be getting into the to the show next week. And man, I am like, I am beyond excited for this because yeah. I want to see this brought to life so much. And I know it's going to be different. They're going to make changes, but it feels like the hands that this, this show is in, they're going to be good changes, you know? And yeah. um, I want to see these characters on screen. I want to see them brought to life. Uh, I want to see... It's going to be harrowing, but like, I just can't wait to like to to feel immersed in this world. And we couldn't have had a better project for this month, too, right? Like, we're we're it's October. We're wanting to get into spooky stuff and like a mm-hmm. horror project, which we normally do. Yet, it's also tied so directly to racism and the fact that we're leading up to the election. Um, I just I'm really glad that we have this project to talk about it. It feels like perfectly aligned to the kind of things we're going to want to talk about. Like we want to have fun and talk about spooky shit, but we also want to continue to talk about the problems that are so important right now. And yeah. I want to make sure are on everyone's minds going into the election. So um, speaking of that, we said earlier, make sure you vote. Um, vote for Joe Biden because Donald Trump is a piece of garbage and we got to get him out of there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, oh, and and vote down the down the ballot too, because there's so many important Senate races happening. Um, there's so many important local elections. So so make sure to to like you know it only takes a, a few minutes to do research into a lot of this stuff and and make sure you're voting down the ballot because that stuff is also incredibly important. Yes, definitely. Please get out there and vote. If you like this episode, please let us know in some sort of rating or review, whether it's on Apple, whether it's on Google Play, whatever platform you can. Uh, we really appreciate that. It helps get the word out for the podcast and continue helps us to continue to grow. Yeah, and if you found us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe, like the video. I know we got a lot of people who stumble onto these things we post, and I think they are expecting it to be the actual episode in question, and it's not, or it's the, or they think it's the audiobook and it's not, so they give us a downvote, so or th- dislike, whatever it's called. Um, yeah, well, that'd be greatly appreciated because we are actually starting to get some steam on YouTube, which has been pretty cool. Yeah, um, smash that smash that notification bell yeah, yeah like ring subscribe. the bell smash the all, subscribe button all the youtube all the youtube <laughs> things <laughs> absolutely yes and make sure to connect with us on social media we're at ink to film basically everywhere facebook uh twitter instagram all of that and also uh make sure you join the council of inklings on facebook it's a great place to we post polls we post any sort of adaptation news we see upcoming projects anything we're excited about and it's a good way to stay connected in that way Absolutely. And if you would like to support this podcast financially, check out our Patreon. We uh, just released a bonus episode on there where we're talking about Michael Moorcock's epic poo essay, which he wrote all about Lord of the Rings, um, kind of talking about why it's actually bad. (laughs) Um, And uh, we engage with that because like we spent a lot of time covering Lord of the Rings. We had a lot of opinions about it. And I thought it was a really interesting conversation we were able to have and engage with a lot of the points that he brought up, which were um, really interesting, really interesting stuff. So if that sounds interesting to you, check it out. We also have lots of other stuff on there. 20 seven other episodes um that that uh, most of them are exclusive to patreon so definitely check that out if it interests you and thank you to russ bugden for the use of our intro and outro music all right guys i'm so excited to be finally covering lovecraft country um excited for next week when we get into the tv series so hopefully you rejoin us again for that and until next time thanks for listening <laughs> <laughs>